Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Clarifying Catholicism. Ordinarily, we explore theological topics, but in this series, we investigate the writings of, in my opinion, the most important little-known philosopher of the 20th century, Javier Zubiri. This is not a theological series at all whatsoever. However, if you want to do good theology, you'll need a good philosophical backbone first. So if you want to check out the rest of the episodes in this series, check the link in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. We've arrived at truth. Or perhaps more accurately, we are producing truth, as I'll explain later. Before we go any further, let's review a few other terms we've studied so far. Remember that what makes Zubiri's vision radically different from classical philosophers is that he believes that reality isn't something to be grasped or reached for. Rather, it is something that is all around us and is dynamic. Reality is defined as formalized content. More specifically, it is connecting the dots of different things we have apprehended into a constellation of relationships. This connecting physical process is an ulterior apprehension called the Logos. The physicality of reality and logos means that they, like other physical processes, are dynamic. But just because they're dynamic doesn't mean they're relativistic or self-determined, rather they are dependent on the real content that shapes them. If I throw a brick at someone's head, the mind cannot help but construct the reality that is pain. If I make a video series about a very dense philosophical system, your mind cannot help but construct the reality that is confusion every now and then. We are at the mercy of the real, which we directly engage with via the primordial apprehension, or raw stimulation. But the reality that is constructed from the real is not out there, it is around us. The first kind of ulterior apprehension, the logos, organizes reality into a field. Basically, when you apprehend something, it is placed into a relationship among and by other already apprehended things. But that thing doesn't just bend the whim of other things in the field, rather it generates its own field that impacts things in the broader field. Think of it like placing a magnet among other magnets. Magnet A isn't just affected by magnets B and C, rather magnet A is also affecting magnets B and C. Thus, Logos interconnects all things we've apprehended into one grand field of reality. Now just like magnets can attract but also repel each other, sometimes there is tension among the fields. When there is tension between fields within the grander field of reality, you enter a state of unreality. Zubiri calls it unreality because reality is all about formalizing content, meaning there is a harmony, a coherence to the relationship between things you apprehend. Unreality, therefore, is a lack of harmony or coherence between things. How can you tell when something's become dislodged from reality? Think about when you're trying to solve a really difficult puzzle or questioning a firmly held belief. There's an unsettling, uneasy, sometimes even painful mental feeling that accompanies these occurrences, which are stimulated by the real. Recall how, although it's commonly said we only have five senses, taste, touch, sight, sound, and smell, Zubiri extends these to include things like a sense of towards or direction that are traditionally associated with the mind. But because Zubiri, unlike many modern philosophers who profess a rigid distinction between body and mind, promotes a unity between body and mind, the so-called internal, intellective, or mental senses are just as physical as the traditionally called physical ones. In a sense, it's like the body and mind have been given an internal gauge that can tell us when something fits into reality or not. When something place in reality is being questioned, it has entered unreality. However, when its place in reality has been affirmed or reaffirmed, we say that a judgment has been made about it. So we've covered how we can tell when something is in a state of unreality, but how do we know when we've successfully made a judgment about it? It's not like we have some sort of physical indicator that tells us a judgment has been made, like sweat tells us when we've been exercising, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I present truth. Let's step back a little, though. Now, in episode one, we described how, according to traditional metaphysics, reality exists outside the physical world and is reachable by the soul. 
Everything physical is temporary and changing. Everything real is fixed and eternal. It is the soul's job as an extrinsic agent, an alien force to this world, to judge whether or not particular occurrences in the physical plane of existence align with the eternal, unchanging realities in the metaphysical plane of existence. When this alignment between physical occurrence and metaphysical reality happens, classical philosophers say that a statement is true. For example, they would say that it is true that a boiling tea kettle is hot because when we feel it, the soul draws a connection between the individual sensation of the tea kettle and the unchanging metaphysical quality of heat. That quality of heat, according to classical philosophers, exists independent of all sensation. It is the soul's job to draw the connection between us and that quality. And when it does so, we know that something is true. This is very problematic to Zubiri. First of all, it relies on the assumption that we do not exist in reality, rather we reach for it. But if reality isn't around us and our intellects are purely spiritual, how can there be any connection between our senses and intellects at all? Second, it fails to account for the impact the physical world has upon the intellect's understanding of reality. Imagine you've only eaten bacon your whole life. No fruits, no veggies, no additive soy products that are destroying our bodies. Just pure bliss. If you only subsisted on bacon, and someone asked you to define what food tastes like, you'd probably limit your definition to something that has the qualities of bacon, since that's all you've ever experienced. Heck, on a subatomic level, your all-you-can-meat diet probably altered something in your taste buds. Somewhere out in the world, maybe someone has only eaten Brussels sprouts their whole life. And their definition of food's taste is basically just the qualities of Brussels sprouts. You two would have very definitions of what food tastes like because you experienced two different kinds of food, but assumed that your souls had grasped the essence of what food tastes like. If reality is something to be reached for, how do we know when we reached it? Think of how medieval scientists were so confident that the Earth was the center of the universe. They thought that all of their rigorous observations and calculations had led their souls to point to a geocentric universe. However, their intellects were inhibited by their lack of awareness of things that telescopes soon informed them about. Yet they thought that their souls grasped truth. In a nutshell, if we believe that truth is what is real, and what is real is outside the mind and accessible via the soul, how do we know when the soul has accessed reality? Medieval astronomers sure thought they did. Given how in previous episodes we've demonstrated that reality belongs around us, rather than beyond us, the classical definition of truth is no longer adequate. Truth cannot be something external that we reach for. Truth, like reality, is something we are born into. Just as we cannot stop formalizing content, making judgments, and embedding ourselves into reality, truth, too, concerns the formalization of content, and it is not extrinsic to us. So, what is truth, then? For the ancients and medievals, truth was indeed an intellective activity. Zubiri agrees here. But for the ancients and medievals, truth was extrinsic, an agreement of thought from the soul and things the body experienced. Zubiri goes in a different direction. Just as reality is a physical structure, intellection is too a physical activity. This means that truth isn't about corresponding particulars to divine forms. So if truth concerns the intellect, but isn't a non-physical property, how does it occur? Now, while reality concerns all formalized content, we aren't always cognizant of this formalized content. For example, if I feel warm and notice a house on fire but don't really connect the dots between them, the fact that I feel warm and the fact that the house is on fire is placed in my reality, but my intellect isn't really working yet, since it's not actively relating the two things to each other. Once I say, ah, that house fire is causing the heat, I have brought the reality of the house fire causing heat to an intellective presence. This intellective presence produces truth. Here is Zubiri's definition of truth. Truth is the moment that reality is brought to our intellect's presence. Basically, while reality is constantly forming around me regardless of my intellect's participation, truth strictly concerns my intellect's participation in the formation of reality. 
Essentially, in the moment reality and an election coincide, truth is produced. Think of it like this. If you're running around a track, your legs are exercising. And if your legs are exercising efficiently, they produce sweat, a physical indicator of exercise. For Zubiri, our intellective functions are just as physical as things like running, because our intellects are just as affected by chemicals, hormones, etc. Just as a good run produces sweat as an indicator to the body that it is working hard, a good math problem or puzzle produces truth as an indicator to the body that it is thinking well. Statements that meet the requirement of intelligizing, or as Zubiri calls it, truthifying reality well, are called true statements. Now I want to make it crystal clear that the production of truth is not contained to judgments, rather it refers to what is produced in any intellective activity. Remember that judgments strictly concern apprehensions that have already occurred. They're all about evaluating things that have already happened. But the intellect is constantly working, even when it's not evaluating things we've already done. Even when we're absorbing raw stimuli, our intellects are at work. This means that the production of truth is not something unique to the logos or judgments. Rather, it occurs in the primordial apprehension, in our raw stimulation as well. When a flame burns me and I instinctively think, hot, I am still intelligizing or truthifying something. Because this type of truthification concerns raw stimuli to real content without formalizing it yet, Zubiri calls this type of truth real truth. And because primordial apprehensions don't concern the formalization of content into reality, rather just raw content, every primordial apprehension is true. Think of it like this. I touch a flame and I think, hot. That's true. I felt hotness. I taste steak and I think, delicious. That's true. I tasted deliciousness. I see a hooded figure on the street and I think, fear. That's true, I felt fear. Basically, a way to think about real truth is that it is produced when our intellect responds to real content in the most primitive way. There are raw, primal feelings, and those feelings can vary between people. Keep that in mind. However, once we start connecting things to each other, once we start formalizing content and move away from raw stimuli to sentient intelligence, then we can say some things are true and others are false. This is because we cannot deny our raw, primal feelings. We can, however, deny their connections to each other, once that Logos tries connecting them. Think of it like this. I can't deny that I feel hot. I can't deny that I see ice cubes. I can, however, deny that ice cubes cause heat. This is how Zubiri approaches the problem of difference, meaning how can people agree and disagree about different things? It is because we can primordially apprehend very different things. What's painful to me might not be as painful to you. What scares me might not scare you. Every person apprehends very different content in very different ways. Hence, we have differences. But if we can successfully connect our apprehensions in similar manners, then we can arrive at agreements. Because it deals with connections between different apprehensions, the type of truth that is produced and strengthened by connections in the Logos is called dual truth. And dual truth depends on real truth to be sustained. Think of it like this. I see a hooded figure on a sidewalk approach me. I instinctively feel, or primordially apprehend, fear. Thus, my intellect tells me, fear, fear, fear. That fear is undeniable. It is true. However, when I connect that primal feeling of fear to the hooded figure, I say, Via the Logos, hooded figure is dangerous. This connection between danger and hooded figure can be stable or unstable. If I say hooded figure is dangerous, but it turns out to be a Benedictine monk offering me his finest homebrew IPA, that connection between hooded figure and dangerous would be destroyed, thus rendering that statement false. Think of dual truth as an indicator, a thermometer that tells you how strong a connection between things according to the Logos is. Just as your arm produces pain when it isn't functioning well, your intellect produces error when it's not functioning well. And, like pain depends on the real world impacting your arm, error depends on the real world shaping the intellect. Next episode, we'll focus more on dual truth. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.